Hello everybody. So two new gen neocons just published a piece in the once reputable but now completely decrepit policy magazine Foreign Affairs. I need to share that with you because it shows exemplary why we cannot expect the United States to become any less aggressive in the near future, even if a change of administration should come in November. The mindset of these people is just utterly bellicose, and they are part of a network of neocons in or near the levers of power, and of course they are part of the military-industrial think tank complex, or, you know, permanent Washington. I'm talking about this article here with the title No Substitute for Victory. America's competition with China must be won, not managed. It's all about winning and it's all about who who gets to be kingpin and who has to uh, who has to be the loser, right? And who is going to be defeated? It's the it's the people who think about the Cold War about a com of a, a competition that was won by the United States and lost by the Soviet Union, and that's how things are supposed to be. Um, and this is continuing. So, who are these people who wrote that? It's and that's why it's important. Matt Puttinger and Mike Gallagher. If these names don't ring a bell, I forgive you, I also didn't, didn't know about them, but turns out they're actually quite important people. Math, Matthew Pottinger is this guy here, um, born in 73, and he used to be the United States Principal Deputy National Security Advisor. Now, who is that? That's the guy serving right under, the position serving right under the uh, actual uh, National Security Advisor, and he was in, he was in power, he was in power, he was advising the U.S. president to 2019 to 2021 under Donald Trump uh, for a relatively long time, for two or like almost like three, nearly three years, which makes him stand out in the crowd because under under Donald Trump there was such a big turnaround, right? Um, and he currently he currently is parked. He's parked as a distinguished visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution and chair of the China program at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. So he's in one of these think tanks where he's he's currently getting a salary, probably a very nice one, and he gets to do all of the presentations and blah, blah, blah. But uh, don't be mistaken, he's way too young to be <laughs> to, to go retire anytime soon. He's parked there. And if Donald Trump comes back, I would suppose that, that he might have chances to become the next Jake Sullivan, the actual national security advisor. So he he's he's somebody to look look out for. And then the other guy, the other guy who wrote this is Mike Gallagher. He is a um he at the moment is still serving as a um, in the House of Representatives, um, he resigned. Though uh, he's not going to serve out his the rest of his term, his um, eight or nine uh, remaining months, because because uh, he 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 got a job. <laughs> he got a job with um, the data analytics company Palantir as this journal here calls it. But Palantir, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is of course a a contractor of the United uh, of the United States Army. So just recently, it Palantir won 178 million contract to build next gen intelligence ground stations for the um, for the army. Uh, and Palantir currently currently uh, from the Department of Defense has 200 is under uh, obligation to deliver on 276 million dollars so a quarter of a billion dollars when are currently being used by this company in order to develop something and mr gallagher who well is the representative he's now he's now going there <laughs> instead of ending like finishing his term and um as he's as he's done with his official assignment he seems to have decided that he's gonna deliver one more blow to china and write why the biden administration has been so horribly weak and how the united states needs to be much stronger on china so um Let's go through this because this is the vision of people who are now, you know, they're, they're both of them are now parked and both of them might come back in one way or another or both of them might influence the institutions that they're in in order to get these policies, uh, to see these policies come to fruition. That's why, that's why this matters. So they write that amid a presidency beset by failures of deterrence in Afghanistan, Ukraine and the Middle East. The Biden administration's China policy has stood out as a relatively bright spot. So what the what they are saying, interestingly, is that 
Afghanistan, and Ukraine, and the Middle East are a deterrence failures. I wonder how you frame Afghanistan as a deterrence failure. You fail to 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 deter the Taliban to make sure that the Afghan government that you put into in place doesn't collapse. How is how is that a deterrence failure? But anyhow, this is this is their mindset, you know, since the United States, they would never try to portray it as aggressive, right? So it's just about deterrence, about defending what you've got. Um, and the Middle East, that the Middle East is in here as well, and that, that what has happened between Hamas and Israel is apparently portrayed by these people as a, as a lack of deterrence from the US side is also interesting. It just tells you that they feel entitled to be in charge of the entire world, right? <laughs> Everything in every place where, where the US has um, military outposts and has any kind of interests, there uh, you need to use deterrence in order to get what you want, or you need to use military power to get what you want. And if you don't get what you want, if something else happens, then it's a failure of deterrence. That's the mindset that they operate under. And then the article actually describes that the Biden uh, uh, administration has been, you know, semi-tough on on China, but the big mistake is that uh, that Biden wants to manage competition, as Mr. Biden says himself. Uh, what these people here want, they want a commitment to fight a Cold War and fight it out to the end, right? The U this is the goal, according to them. The United States shouldn't manage the competition with China, it should win it. B Beijing is pursuing a raft of global initiatives designed to disintegrate the West and usher in an anti-democratic order, despite the fact that you China keeps saying time and again that they don't interfere in other countries internal affairs they just that's just not what they do they they officially say that's not that's not they're not in that business and they have no problem with democratic mongolia living right next to them they have no problem interacting with japan they have no problem interacting with any kind of democracy they visit them all the time but according to these people uh, well, China is just is just working on destroying all the democracies around the world. While this article <laughs> tells us that this is exactly what they want to do to China, right? That they want to regime change China. Because here it comes. Well, what would winning look like, says the article? China's communist rulers would give up trying to prevail in a hot or cold conflict with the United States and its friends. So do, the Chinese would not would not compete anymore with the US. But that's only half, half of what the article says, what, what they should strive for. There's a second half. And the Chinese people, from ruling elites to everyday citizens, would find inspiration to explore new models of development and governance that don't rely on repression at home and compulsive hostility abroad, aka regime change, something new, not the CCP, something else. And uh, I, I remind you, this uh, guy here, Mike, Mike Gulliger, he was on the, he was the chair of the House Committee on the Chinese Communist Party. I wasn't aware that the uh, House of Representatives has a committee on the Chinese Communist Party. Just imagine for a second what would happen if the, if, if the China, if the CCP had a, had a House Committee on the Democratic Party in the United States and the Republican Party of the United States. And if, if China, if the CCP officially said that their goal is to, uh, to make sure that both of these parties disintegrate and that the third party comes to power. Imagine if they actually said something like that, even in, in, in just in publications by like semi-official, semi-officials. Um, the US is really the only country that so outspokenly um, calls others, calls for other states' uh, the, uh, political systems to change. Well, then the article complains a lot about uh, how Washington has been too weak. Um, and uh, here, this one, no country should relish waging another Cold War, yet a Cold War is already being waged against the United States by China's leaders. So these people frame it as in you know it's always the same thing um war or a cold war or a competition is not what we want we don't want that it's being pushed on us therefore we like heavy-heartedly have to respond and we have to respond forcefully unfortunately it's always the same framing like we didn't choose this fight but we will end it you know that that rhetoric that rhetoric that's being used in order to sell any kind of war hot or cold to the the um, common people right on the ground 
As it turned out, however, the article says, aggression would come from the um, opposite direction in Europe. Less than three weeks before invading Ukraine, Russian President Vladimir Putin had signed a no-limit security pact with Xi, uh, with Xi in Beijing. This is um, a narrative that neocons come back to time and again. The fact that three weeks before Ukraine, the, before Russia went into Ukraine, uh, that there was a meeting between Xi and Putin and that they had a good time and actually and actually shook hands and said like, yeah, we are going to have a, a good relationship. They used that again and again in order to associate China with what Russia has been doing in Ukraine, right? To, to, to consolidate this this image that these two powers are in it together, even though the Chinese haven't been sending any uh, weapons to, to Russia and have been trying to be relatively neutral in the conflict between, between Russia and Ukraine to the point where the Chinese are able to speak to the Ukrainians and able to speak to the, to the Russians, right? The article continues. In a prudent step after the invasion, Biden drew a red line by warning Xi in a video call that the US government would impose sweeping sanctions if China provided material support for Moscow. I need to comment on this because this, this sentence implies that it was um, the U US threat of sanctions that kept China from sending weapons to, uh, to Russia, which just isn't the case. Russia had, uh, China had, has no interest in this conflict between Russia and Ukraine. China really has none. China has good interest in having good relations with Russia and good relations with the Ukraine. Therefore, they are not trying to help either side in this conflict. It's not the threat of, U of US sanctions. And the, the interpretation thereof is either a lie or an utter misunderstanding of uh, what, what, what China's interests are in, uh, in Eurasia, right? The article continues, she nonetheless found plenty of ways to support the Russian war machine, sending semiconductors, unarmed drones, gunpowder, and, and other wares. <laughs> Again, these, these are things that China was trading with Russia even before and after the, uh, after the outbreak of the war and the Europeans and the Americans put all of these sanctions on Russia, well, Russia looked for other outlets for its own, um, for its own goods and its oil, and China was more than happy to buy that because they have normal relations. It's not a matter of uh, supporting the war effort of, of Russia. It's a matter of continuing normal, a normal relationship with the Russians. And this, this interpretation that anything and everything um, happens because either the United States wants it or not, it's just uh, it's extremely self-absorbed. But it's a um, it's it's a hallmark of the neocons, really. The article then has has this part in here. If ever the time was ripe to call out Beijing for fomenting chaos and to start systematically imposing costs on the country in response, it was early 2023. Biden inexplicably was doing the opposite. So, yeah just trying to show that the, the United States is basically under attack by, by China because China doesn't do exactly what the United States tells it to do and therefore you need to put on more pressure. That's the entire gist of, the, of, this, um, of this article. It continues, in June 2023, leaks to the press revealed that Beijing, in a remarkable echo of Cold War, was planning to build a joint military training base in Cuba and had already developed a uh, as signals intelligence facility there targeting the United States. The same people who argue that every country is free to choose its own military alliances, and of course Ukraine is allowed to join NATO because every country can join any military alliance, will immediately tell you that China and Cuba cannot have a military alliance, cannot even have any kind of military agreements, um, because that would be a huge threat to U.S. national security. The same people, but they, of course, of course, the, the rules that, 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 that count for the United States in their mindset is not the rules that count for everybody else. And the rules-based international order is an order in which the United States makes the rules for everybody else and then orders everybody else to follow. That's, that's the neocon mindset. Any doubts that she saw the American posture as one of weakness were dispelled after Hamas' October 7 massacre in Israel. 
Beijing exploited the attack by serving up endless anti-Israeli and anti-American propaganda through TikTok, whose algorithms are subject to control by the Chinese Communist Party. Chinese diplomats, like Russian ones, met with Hamas leaders and provided diplomatic cover for the terrorist group, vetoing UN Security Council resolu resolutions that would have condemned Hamas. The, anyone who has been following what has been happening over the last six months in Israel conflict know that it was the United States that has been vetoing almost each and every uh, Security Council resolution that uh, tried to bring an end to to the conflict and that what the what China did and also what Russia do in fact was to say like hey this this war in the Middle East should stop should end as soon as possible and we have problems on uh, on both sides here and talking to both sides in order to bring an end to a war is something that these that these people these neocons interpret as as a grave danger and uh, and making everything worse in the Middle East um, as if though it hadn't been China that actually brokered before before the outbreak of the of the war a an, an understanding between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia you know that that was that was due to uh, Chinese foreign policy not because of uh, U.S. Uh, interventions and trying to bring peace to the region. Um, and and there's a there's a clear obsession here with TikTok. TikTok uh, keeps coming up on other places again. And you know um, the dude Mike uh, Gallagher, he was one of the people who like pushed very hard for a ban on uh, of TikTok uh, because apparently even though this is a completely uh, a U.S. owned uh, company headed by a Singaporean and so on, they he they see a threat in all and anything that is some in some way shape or form connected to China and they would like to 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 cut all of those those cords and links off also in uh, decoupling as uh, as much as, as somehow possible uh, the the article continues at some point um, Washington must adopt a similar attitude today and try harder to disseminate truthful information within China itself and to make it possible for Chinese citizens to communicate securely with one another so the same people who say like we must make sure that China has no influence over our information space are the people who say we need to get some form of lever over the information space in China in order to propagandize their um, population to rise up and overthrow the government <laughs> That's maybe and that's why they are, of course, afraid of TikTok and, and, and any way in which China could interact with the U.S. population, because because they know that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to undermine the Chinese government by interacting on the Internet with the population of, of China. And they are very much afraid that China could try anything kind of similar, <laughs> which is why we're seeing the current drive toward um curbing the internet and curbing the information space and making sure that only messages that are that are wanted by um by, by the, uh, Washington by London by Paris and so on get to the people get to the people and that, that people on the ground do not get a, a multitude of voices because you cannot let the Russians or any kind of Russian information seep through to European or, um, or 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 the U.S. population, at least not in a, in a large scale. And, and while they are calling for more freedom of information in China and in Russia, they're also calling for less freedom of information at home. That's the that's the mindset um, of of the people. The article continues: Beijing is waging a bitter information war against the United States, which is losing despite its natural advantages she and his inner circle see themselves as fighting an existential ideological ideological campaign against the west funnily th funny enough it's of course these neocons it's them who are fighting an ideological war it's them who like under the banner of spreading democracy are willing to go to the to a third world war right? it's they they accuse the other side of exactly what they're doing. That's the that's, that's absolutely fascinating to me. Without being able to reflect on that, or at least they don't they don't show it. I wonder I wonder if they are aware of what they're doing. Um, and then under the last par uh, the last section, they they say that a better policy at the moment for the United States would be uh, one that rearms the United States military, reduces China's economic leverage, and recruits a broader coalition on. To confront China, that's that's the neocon spiel, right? Build as many as many alliances as you can, and then push other alliance partners into the bayonets of whoever you want who you want to fight. That's why the Ukrainians are dying in Europe, and not American or NATO troops, because that's what happens when you when you when you ally yourself with the U.S. 
uh, and, you know, throw more money at the military, more money for the military, because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, that's their worldview. And let's not forget, if you do that, you get hired by these um, by by these uh, organizations that then receive the money. Right. So it's 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 a circular. It's, it's like the money, the money keeps then flowing to the people who, who, who spend, who give the money, who then again give money to to um, politicians who can who can then run for for Congress and and so on. And then uh, again, give more money. It's a huge grift scheme, a huge grift scheme. Um, the article also says that the deterrence Deter deterrence fund should headline a generational effort directed by the president to restore U.S. primacy in Asia. So they would like to have a deterrence fund, like just more money for the military. The priority should be to to maximize existing production lines and build new production capacity for critical munitions for Asia. More war, more weapons, and more money for us who then go and work with these companies who get the money that that we wanna we wanna have spent here, and they call it a deterrence fund. It's it's just so utterly ridiculous. For U.S. forces to actually deter China, they need to be able to move within striking range. Now comes a really interesting one. Listen to this: the threat that Chinese vast missile arsenals pose to U.S. bases the State Department will need to expand hosting and access agreements with allies and partners to extend the U.S. military footprint in the region in order to, read it again, in, in order for the, the, because, sorry, because the threat that Chinese vast missile arsenals pose to, to U.S. bases, and that, those are missile arsenals in mainland China, right? Because China doesn't have missile arsenals outside of its borders. It's like missile arsenals in China. Because those are a threat to U.S. bases that are around China, next to it, in the, in the Pacific. What you need to do in order for these U.S. bases to be better protected is to create more bases closer to China, which you can then say you need to protect from mainland China. So you need to build even more bases. The circular logic and the logic of aggression is amazing. So the, the solution is not to withdraw U.S. bases or to make sure that these U.S. bases are not a threat to China. No, you need to increase the threat toward China, toward the mainland, in order, in 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 order to do what? Well, it, just to threaten it. It's the it's the logic of militarism, utterly grift militarism. But it's 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 fantastic. It's fantastic. You would need in the United States a complete change of mentality to go away. And, and, and advocate for withdrawal, because again, the reason why no Swiss military bases uh, in Asia Pacific are threatened by China is because the Swiss don't have military bases in the Pacific, therefore they're not threatened. So in a, the Swiss are really much better at having their military bases not threatened by China than the United States is. Well, um, the, the article continues that as China doubles down economic self-reliance and phases out important industrial goods from the West, the United States needs to recruit a coalition of friendly partners to deep mutual trade, because even these people understand by now that decoupling from China is going to hurt, it's going to hurt the local economies, and they still live in fairy tale land that you can just supplant that, you know, with a little bit of more trade with Japan, a little bit of more trade maybe with with, with France and the UK, and that's going to make up for it. This is going to, they're going to, there's going to be a hard awakening here. Um, finally, the article says US officials need to recruit everyday Americans to, con to contribute to the fight. Then um, we have to mobilize society is what, what the people uh, propose. So, you know, uh, militarize society, make sure that you have more cannon fodder, make sure that you have more young people who are willing to give their lives in the army. Um, that's the that's the mindset at the end here. Washington should not fear the end state desired by a growing number of Chinese, a China that is able to chart its own course free from communist dictatorship. Again, regime change is the goal of these of these people. The system that produced an all-encompassing surveillance state forced labor colonies and the genocide of minority groups inside its borders is one that likewise des desecrates Chinese philosophy and religion. It's, I highlighted this because it's so interesting that, the, that these people think that they understand Chinese philosophy and religion even better than uh, Chinese, of course. Um, white man's burden, right? You need, to, you need to make these people understand what their own culture is about. 
And then it ends with the following. If the 1970s taught Washington anything, it is that trying to achieve a stable and durable balance of power at detente with a powerful and ambitious Leninist dictatorship is also doomed to backfire on the United States. The best strategy which which found its ultimate synthesis in Reagan years was to convince the Soviets that they were on a path to lose, which in turn uh, fueled doubts about their whole system. Uh, the US victory wasn't uh, Reagan's alone, of course. Uh, a lot of people contributed is what the what the what these two people are saying. And this is this is their view on what the Cold War was about and that the Cold War was about winning and that uh, that in the end, the Reagan could outcompete the the Soviet Union. And Ambassador Jack Matlock, the US, the last US ambassador to the Soviet Union, keeps repeating time and again that the Cold War didn't end when the Soviet Union collapsed. The Cold War ended in 1989 when all of the arms agreements were were put into place, and when the Cold War was when when it was agreed that the Cold War was ended, the collapse of the Soviet Union was wasn't even in the interest of the political leadership of the United States at the time. Which is why in 1991 you had President George Bush Senior in the Rada of Ukraine, telling the Ukrainian parliament, please don't secede from the Soviet Union. Uh, we don't want the Soviet Union to collapse because who knows what's going to happen. Um, don't go into civil war. It would be very dangerous because of the nuclear weapons. This was not this was not planned. Uh, this was not desired by, by the political leadership. And the, the, re, the way that these people reimagine, rethink um, the end of the Cold War to fit their narrative that then is supposed to inform the future narrative of having a, a, a great power um, contest with China. That is the scary part, that they really misunderstand completely, utterly or utterly misrepresent uh, how the last such contest ended. And that's why we lost that, con that, that peace that was then started to break out in the 1990s. We lost the peace in Europe, in, within the United States, with, with the Soviet Union, with Russia, and squandered it in 30 years of megalom megalomania and, and, uh, and um, triumphalism. This triumphalism destroyed everything. So um, she says the article is an agent of chaos, again, pure evil, right, um, and represents CCP imperialism. <laughs> So this article is not an example for uh, U.S. American imperialism. Actually, the article wants to warn us from CCP imperialism, although the CCP does not try to foster communist regimes abroad. It really doesn't. And it doesn't try to overthrow uh, governments abroad. That the only, the only country on earth that systematically tries to overthrow other governments at the moment is the United States of America. <laughs> That's the, that's, the, that's the sad truth. As Chinese leaders are fond of saying and understanding that the CCP has no desire to coexist infinitely with great powers that promote liberal values and thus present fundamental threat to its rule. That's how the, that's how the neocons try to portray uh, China, although it's exactly the, the other way around. It's the, uh, the, US, the US system that has no intention to live with, with, uh, with China, while at the same time it's utterly happy to live with the communist, uh, the, the communist re uh, regime in Vietnam, right? just recently updated the upgraded the foreign relations and vietnam is also a communist regime but that one is fine that one is now a partner the other one in china the other one in beijing that's the problem so the article ends with as taiwan's example makes plain china could be such a place to a democracy that road to get there might be long but for the united states own security as well as the rights and aspirations of all those in china it is the only workable desti uh, destination regime change not just for us not just for the united states not just for the west but regime change for the chinese people because last time a uh, communist regime broke up in the soviet union it ended so well for them right the 1990s were such a wonderful period in uh, in russia it was it was it was absolutely devastating for the people there and the neocons and the neolibs who then um who sold out the who sold out russia and the russian economy they enriched themselves hugely and didn't care about the people. So please, nobody misunderstand this. This is not about helping the Chinese people to, to gain any form of independence. This is this is great power politics at its worst. It's zero-sum thinking at its worst. It is um, belligerence at its worst. Um, and these people are young, 40, 50, and they're waiting for the next administration 
democratic or republican uh, and people who think like that are plentiful i don't know how to answer to that i just hope that at some point people with better ideas and with better understanding of history will come to power in the united states maybe a u.s gorbachev might help thank you Thank you.